Good morning. As Barbara mentioned, I was asked to frame the context for this declaration. Some 503 words, which I'd never read until a few months ago. I don't know about all of you. So it was issued as a declaration by six, maybe seven men on behalf of professional organization and foundation. I say seven because you'll notice that Ian McCarg lists Connie Worth at the meeting as well. Don't know if he didn't want to sign or couldn't make it. Uh, there's still a lot we don't know about this place uh, in time and the work that was done. What I'd like to do is share with you my speculations, because I must admit they still are speculative, uh, about the motivations, who the audience was for this work, and what context was being responded to. I'm going to suggest that a conception of the good life, and not a concern just for the biophysical environment, was at the heart of this enterprise. What I'd like to do is uh, set the stage by framing several different contexts and starting with the one that might be the most familiar to us. What was the context that these individuals uh, knew uh, and were operating uh, within? Within the profession, um, a very small group of people, a couple thousand members of the ASLA. I remember Pete Walker telling me there might be two or three hundred people at an ASLA meeting, and that was a, a big deal in the 60s. Only 15 to 20 programs in landscape architecture, but some incredible work being built. Uh, much work that is now canonical in our field. Um, new conceptions of public space, new responses to the challenges of urban living and incredible scales of work, work that took on the metropolis, the landscape framework for cities like Washington and Baltimore. And this uh, Potomac Task Force will come into play a little bit later, a project that McCarg worked on that was organized by the American Institute of Architects. So if you look at the work, you start to wonder what's the crisis. But if you look at the events that Barbara mentioned and the books that we know were written in this period, and these are just a two of many, we understand that there was a crisis, a crisis of the changing urban landscape of the United States uh, and a, a concern about the capacity and the quality of growth. Those events and that work might be understood in conjunction with this event, a big traveling retrospective on Olmsted who was introduced as a social and environmental reformer. And this allows us to see a connection between political events and the profession and to understand our relationship to urban, social, and environmental change. I found Melanie Simo's writings uh, quite interesting in this regard and in in that she writes, it was a time of imbalance and extreme. While the United States was engaged in an undeclared war, in Southeast Asia, there was also an openly declared war on the polluters and deprivers of the planet's resources, a war more commonly known as the environmental movement. And she goes on to say, if you want to recapture the sense of this turbulent period and the impact on the profession, you have to go beyond looking at the built work that was published and to recognize the writings of people like Grady Clay, one of the signers, who was the editor of Landscape Architecture, and who wrote often about social and political issues, the way Brad McKee does today, uh, and who called for a tough and critical review of the policies and practices that impacted the environment. One of Clay's readers was this woman, Lady Bird Johnson, who I'm going to argue had a big influence on the Declaration and why we are here today. She wasn't just a beautifier. Those are not garden gloves she's got on, though. She was an advocate for urban parks, for highway redesign, and for the conservation of uh, native and local plant communities. So if we're going to appreciate the import of the declaration, we have to expand our concerns, stop looking at what landscape architects were saying to each other in building, and to uh, understand their relationships with people outside the field. So I started doing this uh, through a simple mapping of events, trying to understand what was happening when these writings and works um, before uh, the period we're looking at 
uh, occurred, and you'll notice I mentioned Johnson assuming the presidency, because I came to realize that right before the writing of the Declaration, uh, Johnson got involved uh, through his writings in the discussion of the future of the urban environment in the State of the Union, uh, in the, his Great Society talk at the University of Michigan, in a number of different venues, he talked about the fact that the beauty of America had sustained our spirit, enlarged our vision, we need to save what we have and build more, and I think most importantly, within our cities, imaginative programs are needed. He was talking about the role of design uh, as well as conservation. So a cluster of events happened right before the actual uh, founding of the foundation and the signing of the declaration, which allow us to uh, begin to appreciate that this was not just a, uh, an internally motivated document, but it was actually supported by a larger uh, political framework, and it gave rise to some very interesting things that happened immediately thereafter in terms of changes in academic programs as well as the kind of work uh, that was being done. So when we think about this issue of uh, the context, we need to think about this period of uncertainty as including an interconnection of social and ecological as well as uh, design events. This was understood to people like Grady Clay. It was understood to people like the Halperins, who I think were not involved, uh, Larry Halpern, in this event. Uh, because of um, these workshops that were happening uh, at the same time. Uh, but that's a, another story. I'll do it another time. Um, but it was also apparent to Lady Bird, who in her diary, the year before uh, this event happened, the Declaration, and right before the State of the Union, where Johnson talked about beauty, she writes, getting on the subject of beautification is like picking up a tangled skein of wool. All the threads are interwoven, Recreation, pollution, mental health, crime, rapid transit, highway beautification, the war on poverty, and parks. She got it. And I mention this because her conception of landscape was much more complex, I think, than many landscape architects in the 60s. And in fact, uh, more nuanced on the first reading of the Declaration. But it resonates with our 21st century conceptions of the landscape as a mesh of human and non-human life and matter. So let's think about her as more than a beautification advocate. She was a patron of McCarg and Halperin and many other landscape architects. She knew political figures like Worth, uh, who was with the National Park Service, uh, the director at the time. Uh, she was interacting with Stuart Udall and others, uh, there with Udall and Lawrence uh, uh, Rockefeller. And she was a fan. She, she was described by uh, McCarg as a fan of his, who takes notes during my speeches, assuring me she would persuade the president to a more ecological viewpoint. So she will be the background uh, to this uh, quick overview of the environmental agenda of the Johnson administration uh, that connected a human health and well-being uh, with beauty. So while she wasn't one of the signers, all of them interacted in some way with her and in particular, I want to talk about their roles on the White House Conference on Natural Beauty that happened in 1965. Grady Clay was the chair of the Waterfronts uh, Committee. He uh, was served by uh, Connie Worth and Christopher Tunnard. Ian McCarg uh, was on the Landscape Action Committee with William White and Phil Lewis. John Simons chaired Parks and Open Space with Jane Jacobs and Charles Elliott II. This uh, conference, which included about 115 people, had senators, politicians, designers, and planners. And this allows us to understand this group as um, a network uh, interconnected with a group of uh, very influential and caring people. So these professional engagements with government task forces were responses to an opportunity. Uh, these men appreciated there was work to be done, a small profession that needed to grow, and relationships as well as projects to be built. So they were responding in their declaration to an opportunity, a, a milieu for work. But they were also responding to a perceived threat, and that there are several references in Landscape Architecture magazine in 1964 to an AIA declaration that asserted that the architect's responsibility was, quote, for nothing less than the nation's man-made environment 
including the use of land, water, and air, unquote. So the ASLA formally responded to and rejected the AIA's action proposals, and this is happening at the same time that this incredible watershed planning study, one of the first in the United States, that included Grady Clay and Ian McCarg uh, in its task force, was being organized by the AIA. So I have a provisional thesis. I think that the foundation and the declaration were a response to what Dennis Cosgrove would describe as the tensions of the time that affect how things are built. Everyday experience of cities, number one. That was not uh, intellectual, it was a perceived threat. Number two, the political and social response on the part of politicians and citizens and their solicitation of professional expertise. And then third, um, the perceived um, threat of the expansion of the scope of architecture into a field uh, that uh, had too few practitioners, not enough to do the work. So um, we can begin to understand then uh, the declaration within this uh, context of a, a national group interested in what they called natural beauty. The White House Conference on Natural Beauty happens just uh, a few months before the foundation is founded. Uh, Johnson talks about the need for a new conservation that included restoration and innovation and that enhanced our opportunity to interact with beauty in the settings that we lived. This uh, uh, outline for that event um, was um, uh, written by a number of the people we know. In addition, uh, uh, people like Garrett Ekbo, Hideo Sasaki, a number of very uh, senior uh, practitioners, and they uh, focused on a few key issues. That the American city was degraded and that the design and conservation of beauty was important to its regeneration. Uh, that there was a broad understanding of the American landscape um, being a, uh, the American city having a landscape framework. Uh, in fact, the American city was described as having a natural framework and a natural pattern on every block. Um, so um, we get a sense of um, uh, context for this declaration uh, that was fundamentally seeing landscape as part of the solution to creating the good life in the urban uh, condition, and not simply uh, solving environmental problems. So I'm gonna just speak to a couple of key phrases uh, in uh, the document. Uh, this particular passage I think is key because it focuses on the effects on humans um, of pollution and development. It, it focuses on the quality of human life. Uh, this next paragraph is one that might be seen as um, a call to come to Penn for grad school, but it also has, um, at the end of that phrase, the good life. Uh, and that doesn't just refer to Aristotle. Students of American history will know that the great society speech that LBJ gave in 1965 spoke of a good society that fulfilled more than the needs of the body and the demands of commerce, but the desire for beauty and the hunger for community. So LBJ's great society was to create a flourishing community where our people can come to live the good life. So the good life in this document implies the role of design, the design of um, uh, aesthetically um, important spaces in the environment of man. That reference is veiled to us um, if we don't understand uh, the great society rhetoric. The um, last uh, part of the passage, which I think is also important, relates to this issue of a professional ethos and the scope of our work. This passage becomes obviously all the more meaningful when we know about that AIA declaration that architects were responsible for the use of land, water, and air in the man-made environment. But I would suggest that this is implying that landscape architects are responsible for something different and that is maintaining the vital connection between man and nature. I'm having a hard time reading that, so for those of you who know my writing, just bear with me. Man and nature. This connection is not just one of humans and non-humans or of using natural resources. Landscape architecture is being defined as a different practice 
It had a professional ethos that recognized that designers construct human experiences and that those experiences alter perceived and actual relationships between humans and the planet. So in brief, it is the landscape architect that extends the rhetoric of the great society into a spatial practice. That practice does more than use natural resources wisely. It is predicated on shaping spaces for both human and non-human life and processes both to flourish and that foregrounds their entanglement. We could spend a lot of time celebrating the things that have happened out of this declaration. The number of graduate and undergraduate programs doubled within six years. If anybody knows who paid for that and how that happened, that's a great story. So there are incredible successes. Uh, and there are a lot of continuities when we think about the words that were um, used in either the White House Conference on Natural Beauty or in the Declaration with things that we take on today. But I'd like to suggest that uh, rather than seeing these continuities as varied legacies, that they can all be consumed within a quest for the good life, a life that requires more than bodily needs and the demands for commerce. This group could not have imagined the types of practices that exist today, and I think about my colleagues who I saw over the last uh, couple of events and a few I see um, through the dark here. Uh, they couldn't have imagined the incredible quality of your practices. But we share many of their same concerns, and I think uh, my close reading of what they uh, wrote has done an important thing for me. It's thought about the legacy of those of us who went to school in the 70s and what we benefited from them and what we need to do uh, moving forward. Because we can think about the 60s through a kind of post-madman fantasy, or we can think about it through our own memories. I was a 10-year-old in 1966 wondering what the hell is happening to cities that were being torn up by urban renewal, or my own um, uh, parents first house this nice little suburban house in the middle of the farm fields being uh, demolished so um, I think about our gathering creating the same or better opportunities for a 10 year old boy or girl wondering about analogous concerns such as the impacts of sea level rise on their communities or the potentials for regenerating vast acres of vacant urban land we need to equip and inspire those children with great educational experiences, a meaningful research agenda, and a prospect for a good life. Thank you.